Um, I wanted to let um, our audience know that um, the Q&A functionality is available um, in the Zoom. So you're welcome to go ahead and enter questions that arise um, during the course of the town hall in the Q&A section and people can try to answer them live or um, may also provide written responses. Um, additionally, I have received uh, questions that were emailed to me in advance and I provided those to the panelists as well. Live on Facebook. Great, I think then, um, Linda, you can go ahead and kick us off. Thank you so much. I want to welcome everyone to our town hall this evening. And I also want to thank all of our fantastic subject matter experts who you'll be hearing from over the next hour and a half or so. Um, I really appreciate the participation of all of our fantastic partner agencies and also want to extend, extend an special thanks to Sashi for all of her fantastic hard work in setting up this panel. So thank you so much, Sashi, for convening us tonight. And you know, there are a couple of things that I keep hearing from residents of West County and really folks all around the county. You know, number one is how do I keep my home safe during fire season? And what tools are there available to assist me, right? Folks kind of feel a little bit overwhelmed by this new condition of um, you know, wildfire that we are facing here in Sonoma County. And I've also heard increasing concern regarding homeowners insurance, including folks even living in downtown Guerneville who are being dropped by homeowners insurance policies that they have had for decades. So we are here to try to help you um, on both of those fronts tonight and really to provide, to, provide a, to provide a panel of experts to help answer any questions that you might have. So I'm going to try to keep this brief as an introduction and really let the experts do the talking. But I do want to also begin on a little bit of a note of sobriety, which is that you know we have already faced a number of concerning wildfires in West County, and it is only March. Um, you know, we are really truly facing continually, we always say this, right, unprecedented conditions. When we're looking at moisture levels right now that we wouldn't normally see in June, um, that's a pretty sort of stunning condition that we find ourselves here in West County. I would also add that in addition to these dry conditions, we also have been facing not just one year of dry conditions, but a number of years of especially dry conditions, which have resulted in a substantial tree mortality that we are now seeing, which also adds potential fuel to potential wildfires um, come summer. So we are facing a challenging year but we, we are here really not to concern you or alarm you, but to prepare you because we all have to be part of the solution together and we all have to do our part. Um, you know, we are only as safe as our homes and our neighbors' homes. So this is also about bringing coming together as a community to really educate and support our neighbors to try to create and enhance community preparedness. Um, so with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Sashi to run through our agenda. Um, I want to make sure that we do have plenty of time for the Q&A. So just as a reminder, Leo mentioned this already, but please do utilize that Q&A function and we can respond um, both via text as well as verbally um, throughout the course of this presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Sashi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Supervisor Hopkins. I really wanna commend your commitment to really educating the community and making sure that people's concerns are addressed and, uh, and for bringing together all of these different departments in the county to really support that. Leo, could you get us started with the presentation? Absolutely, just give me one sec. It's a lot of data, so it's taking a little bit of the time to And while we are killing time, I might also mention um, that, you know, I have received a number of concerned uh, sort of outreaches from constituents regarding homeless encampments and warming fires and cooking fires that escape. And I do want everyone to know that we are planning a meeting actually with some of the partners that you see on the screen today to really talk about strategies across agencies to address that. And we're planning on actually bringing that to our Lower Russian River Municipal Advisory Council next month. So stay tuned for additional information and um, there are a lot of different challenges that our communities are facing and we're committed to making sure that each one, you know, we have an opportunity to have a public town hall meeting about and we are also doing work with our government agency partners. And it looks like we've got that going now. Very good, can you full screen that? Leo, if you, is that possible? Yeah, it, it, it's just delayed, it's loading. It's just it's delayed, all. okay, no problem. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I know that 
wildfire is something that's on everybody's mind, but we really wanted to bring you today a sort of a diff different angle on this and really talk to you about wildfire risk and insurance. Could you advance to the next uh, slide? Actually, we're gonna go ahead one more. So as, Superv as Supervisor Hopkins mentioned, these were the kind of questions that, that, that uh, she and her district were really sort of hearing, you know, what can we do to reduce our risk to, of, of losing our coverage? What does the research tell us about how we can reduce our risk, um, the risk to our lives and our property from the threat of wildland fire? And what's kind of on the horizon from the state and what can the county do to help landowners manage their risk? Um, and I can see questions popping up in the Q&A and some of these are gonna get incorporated. Um, we will, as we move along here, could you move to the next slide, please? Okay. so. Um, I think you probably know most of the people on this call. I'm the, I'm the new person because I'm, I'm the newest at um, UC Cooperative Extension here. Um, I am UC Cooperative Extension uh, Santa Rosa's uh, new Wildfire Vegetation Mitigation Program Manager, um, running our new Vegetation Management Division, which Stephanie Larson will be talking about a little bit later. I am a founding board member of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Oop, back up one more, please. Thank you. Um, and on the uh, a council member of the city of Mill Valley in Marin County. And I'm also in the middle right now, I'm, I'm down at the Naval Post Graduate School as part of my master's program um, at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security, focusing on wildfire prevention. So that's it, where I'm coming from. Go ahead and advance. And we're really, all of these people are here as part of Sonoma County government to really just share that Sonoma County is here for you. And you can see all these different departments that really collaborate and coordinate behind the scenes to really make sure that we have all the resources that you need to support you. Next slide, please. So our speakers for this evening are uh, Dr. Stephanie Larson, who I think many of you know, who is our UCCE Sonoma County Director and the Livestock Range Management, Management Advisor. Uh, I am the Wildfire Vegetation Mitigation Program Manager. And then I'm really, really excited to have IBHS here, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, um, and Michael Newman and Daniel Gorham are going to be here, and we are, I believe, one of our, their first public presentations of, the, of their new wildfire prepared home certification, and uh, I think this is really exciting to have them here. And of course, I think most of you know our Cal Fire Division Chief Ben Nichols, and then Carolyn Safford, who everybody knows, um, who is really one of the, the heroes of wildfire prevention in the county, um, our Department Analyst for Permit Sonoma also presenting today. Next slide, please. Uh, there are also a number of people here from the county who will be available to answer questions who aren't going to make a presentation, but they're, they're here. As I said, Sonoma County is here for you to support you. So our agenda tonight, um, we're going to start with kind of telling you about our, our new vegetation management division at UC Cooperative Extension um, and some new tools that we have um, and we're working on for you. And then the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety is going to talk about their wildfire prepared home certification. For those of you who don't know IBHS, they are a, a research institution that works with the insurance industry. And uh, a lot of the new programs that are coming around are based on a bunch of their research. So we're really excited to have them here as a source for that information and that scientific research. Um, then we'll talk about CAL FIRE defensible space zones and uh, an update on requirements from AB 38 and AB 1374. And uh, Permit Sonoma is going to get the Fire Prevention Division is going to give a bunch of updates on a number of programs that you're familiar with. And I won't, I won't uh, um, duplicate what they're going to say. And then um, we're going to share a little bit about the insurance commissioner's new Safer from Wildfire framework. Then we'll do Q&A and then we'll wrap it up. So we're going to do questions all at the end. Um, please continue to drop them in the chat so we won't, won't forget about them. Sorry, in, in the Q&A. Um, and we are also taking questions on Facebook. And you can also if you continue to email questions um, during the presentation and afterwards, and we will follow up with you. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so now I would like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Larson, who is our uh, uh, UC Cooperative Extension Director for Sonoma County. Great, and thank you, Sashi, very much. And thank you for putting this program together and thank all of you who are joining us this evening. So I'm Stephanie Larson, I'm the Director for UC Cooperative Extension. And our vision with UCCE is to create a vegetation management division where we bring the resources from the University of California, which that includes myself, we have fire advisors, forestry advisors, and other resources that we can tap into throughout the state and bring them to the County of Sonoma and partnering with our wonderful county partners that we work so well with, with the Permit Sonoma, Sonoma Water, Ag and Open Space. And with that, we're developing tools that we can implement in the County of Sonoma and working with our out of county partners such as Cal Fire and all those great players that have helped really helped to look at making this a more resilient community 
in Sonoma County. We've got three programs that we're very excited about. Many of you probably heard about the Wildfire Fuel Mapper, and that's a project that UCCE worked very closely with Pepperwood Preserve. And what we've done is developed a set of tools, resources, information that will help landowners with three acres or greater to better understand the vegetation height, type, slope, all the landscape attributes and help you to decide what are the best tools to use to help reduce and manage your vegetation and reduce fire risk and for a numerous resource goals. And we're partnering very closely with Sonoma Water to develop the Wildfire Resilience Planner. And that's going to be a larger landscape frame where we're looking at a spatially explicit model and web-based application to help strategic planning and tracking of fire risk reduction vegetation areas. So in, in particular, we're looking at larger landscapes and we're pulling in landowners, whether it's private or public, and focusing on different areas that we're really at risk and we really need attention to uh, based on the landscape attributes, based on the assets of those landscapes, and really gonna work together to focus. And then I'll also like to mention the Match.Graze. That's a program where we're looking at bringing more grazing opportunities to the county. So say you implement a variety of different tools, but how are you gonna maintain that is through grazing. So with UC Cooperative Extension, our goal is to help private landowners and public land managers to plan vegetation. So we work directly with landowners to reach, uh, achieve their resource goals. We want landowners to better understand long-term resiliency and landscape attributes so they understand what the land is capable of, what their carrying capacity is, what the resources can do and can't do, and then implement these practices that are the best management for a multiple years and then the finally, because these practices don't come cheap and we have not managed these landscapes in a long time, we're looking to connect with grant funding and our car share programs, either within the county or with our state and federal partners. So just to kind of highlight what's really out there and what we've released in the last year, again, with um, the help of our partner at Pepperwood Preserve, is the Wildfire Fuel Mapper. And so I encourage you to go online. You just need to have an APN number and if you have three acres or greater. And what you're gonna get is a report that and maps that help you to better understand the physical topography elements to help assess wildfire hazards. Then we will go out and work with you directly to help you decide where it makes sense based on structure, based on your home, based on the, the, uh, the fire patterns and where would you focus the practices and which focus and in which order would be best to focus those. So with that, um, and also then the program that is uh, going to be released in a couple of months, the Wildfire Resiliency Planner. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a coordinated effort to look at a vegetation management effort. So it's not just a one and done. It's a long-term planning tool that looks at um, aspects and attributes of different lands, whether we're looking at areas that might sequester more carbon, areas that might capture more water, a real strategic plan that ties into the other uh, wonderful plans that we have in the county, uh, and work closely with the CWPP, and really get a coordinated effort for all the county players to work strategically for, with all the landowners in Sonoma County so that we can really build a more resilient landscape for now and in the future. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, hopefully that gave you a little bit of a, a, um, a view into some of the tools that we have that we can use to help you um, do your vegetation management planning. And now I'm very, very excited to introduce um, Michael Newman and Daniel Gorham from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. The IBHS is a well-known research institution that works works uh, in in the in the in the field of insurance they have insurance companies as their members but uh, the insurance companies use their research to to make a lot of decisions on how they um you know i don't want to misspeak michael actually i should probably just let you just let you go ahead and say let you go ahead and sure. start your presentation but uh, um ibhs is a very well respected entity and i'm really really excited that we're bringing them here today to speak yeah Sashi, thank you so much, and uh, thanks. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Hopkins, and uh, the whole community for for having us here tonight. I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, 
This will stop other screen sharing. Yes. Hey, go ahead and do that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, can you folks see my screen? Sorry. Yes, looks great. Okay. Excellent. Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, as Sashi mentioned, my name is Michael Newman. I'm the Senior Director for Law and Public Policy at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, or IBHS. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dan Gorham, who's one of our chief uh, wildfire researchers. We're really so pleased to speak with you tonight about our forthcoming wildfire resilience program, Wildfire Prepared Home. Um, Supervisor Hopkins said at the top of this meeting that uh, it's been a challenging year on the back of several challenging years. Um, and, and that's absolutely true. But the mess, if there's one message that I can impart to you tonight, it's this, we are not powerless. There are actions that we can take. And again, I'm gonna quote your supervisor, um, we're as safe as our homes and as our neighbor's homes. And we have the tools to help you learn how to make your homes and your neighbor's homes safer. Um, and Dan and I'll spend some time tonight uh, talking about that with you. But first, let me give you a little bit of background about who we are. Um, IBHS is an independent nonprofit scientific research and communications organization supported solely by the property insurance and reinsurance industry. From our research center, we study wildfire, wind, rain, and hail, and the way that homes and businesses can become more resilient to severe weather. Our building safety research leads to real world solutions for home and business owners, helping to create more resilient communities. You all know too well that severe weather disrupts lives, displaces families and drives financial loss. At IBHS, we deliver top tier science and then translate it into action so that we can prevent avoidable suffering, strengthen our homes and businesses, inform the insurance industry and support thriving communities. Tonight, we'll talk to you about how Wildfire Prepared Home can help bend down the risk curve for individual homeowners in California. First, however, I want to give you a brief sense of the science that provides the foundation for our program. To do that, I'm going to take you inside of our state-of-the-art research center located in Richburg, South Carolina. So our research center features a six-story test chamber the size of an airplane hangar with 105 fans, six feet in diameter, capable of generating Cat 3 hurricane winds. In this research center, we conduct, re we conduct research in hail, inventing new ways to generate realistic hailstones that support our testing of asphalt shingles. In the wildfire front, we're the only known facility in the US able to test how embers interact with wind and the built environment. We also study how water intrudes on roofs and windows and how to seal it out. And we study the effects of wind on homes, hoping to prevent sites like this. Our research extends to the field to learn what we can after disasters happen. We study the effects of severe weather on commercial structures as well as residential ones. And at full scale, we're able to recreate severe weather. So scientists can see what fails first and understand what we can do to protect the investment of property owners. So let's turn to wildfire, which uh, you all care mostly about. More than chance, communities in California like yours need solutions. How can you better protect your homes? The growing impact of wildfire on suburban communities demands attention and thoughtful mitigation programs. As more and more communities in California are impacted by wildfire, we have heard the growing demand for a solution from our members, the property insurance industry, from homeowners like you, and from California policymakers at the state and local level. With other perils like wind and flood, the mitigation solutions have long been known, and yet wildfire science is a little bit newer. We've seen tremendous advances in the past few years that are critical to the development of wildfire prepared home. And we know there's more work to be done, especially as we look to the community dimensions of wildfire resilience. But uh, as Supervisor Hopkins noted, the past few wildfire seasons have made it clear, we can't wait for all the answers to get started. We need to use what we know right now. We know the solution will be twofold, mitigation at the home level and mitigation at the community level. I'm first gonna touch on that community dimension before diving in a little bit deeper on the details of wildfire prepared home. There's still research to do here on the community scale to understand all the interconnected vulnerabilities. Just yesterday, 
Um, Dan Gorham, my colleague, was and, and others from IBHS convened a gathering of stakeholders in California to discuss the development of a conceptual framework that would guide the development of Wildfire Prepared Community, a sister program to Wildfire Prepared Home. We're going to use insights from existing data sources to inform that program. Things like ISO public protection classifications, California's fire hazard severity zones, firewise communities, fire safe councils, Building on these established programs and coupling these data with the right suite of parcel level mitigation actions will allow us to complement wildfire prepared home with a community dimension. We're gonna keep working on that side of the puzzle through the rest of this year and beyond. But for now, and for the rest of this evening, let's focus on the parcel level. I have another video for you here. Um, as I mentioned before, the Research Center gives us the unique ability to research the intersection of the built environment, wildfire, and in particular embers, and wind. It's the wind, the Santa Ana's, the Diablo wind, that push the fires and the embers that precede them from the wildland into suburban communities. For more than a decade, insurers have funded our work to further our understanding of embers, flame spread, and building components. Over the past 10 years, we've worked to advance the science, fill knowledge gaps and seek out answers. Now that research is bearing fruit. The research from our lab with insights from the broader fire community and collaborations with other researchers in California and elsewhere, we've identified a set of solutions. You can see here uh, some of our fire break research in our test chamber in the research center, um, as well as uh, some additional work we've done on fencing. And uh, finally here on structure separation. So the solutions I referenced have been shared through a series of reports and guidance documents that IBHS has put out in recent years. And we've now distilled these findings into Wildfire Prepared Home, a research-based mitigation designation program that can distinguish a home as wildfire resilient, not wildfire proof, but wildfire resilient. The decade of research I just referenced has taught us that wildfire resilience must be systems based. That is to say, a homeowner must undertake collectively all of the mitigation actions identified in wildfire prepared home to meaningfully bend down the risk curve and receive a designation. That wildfire prepared home designation signals to policymakers, to insurers, to others, to neighbors, that a home's wildfire risk can be meaningfully distinguished from other partially or unmitigated homes. So what's in a wildfire prepared home standard? The mitigation actions required by wildfire prepared home fall into three general categories. First, the roof you have to have a class A fire rated roof. Now, the good news is many of you uh, on this webinar probably already have this. Second, there are two building features that are required. First, ember resistant vents. Um, that's really can be done in a do it yourself project, getting non-combustible, excuse me, non-combustible mesh screen over the vents uh, that give access to either crawl space or attic space in a home. Also, there needs to be a six inch vertical non-combustible clearance at the base of all exterior walls. What we found is that uh, embers will fly through the air and collect in certain places, one of which is the corner of the grounds and the home. Um, that six inch vertical non-combustible clearance can prevent those embers from igniting onto siding material. And then finally, there's a set of def dispensable space requirements um, that are part of the program. First, and, and so critically, you need to maintain the home ignition zone, that zero to five feet area. And I know that uh, Chief Nichols is gonna talk about defensible space later, um, but for the purposes of our program, um, that five feet must be impeccable. And by impeccable, I mean, it cannot have any combustible material, whether uh, organic or otherwise in that five foot zone. And also the airspace over that five feet zone has to be clear. So if you think about trees or other vegetation that may be hanging over the roof or hanging over that five foot home ignition zone, those need to be cut back. Also, the yard needs to be clear of debris. Um, you need to, if you have a deck, 
underneath the deck needs to be, ma be maintained free of combustible material, free of debris. And if the deck is under four, is four feet tall or off the ground or less, you need to enclose it with some type of non-combustible screen. Um, if you have outbuildings on your property, such as dog houses or sheds, or uh, my kids have a play set out back, that needs to be moved away from the home. And finally, to the extent that a home has fencing that connects into the house, this five foot section of fencing that is attaching to the home needs to be replaced with something non-combustible. We've also identified a set of six additional mitigation actions that if undertaken by a homeowner would qualify that home to receive a wildfire prepared home plus designation. Those are removing back-to-back -back fencing. Um, that's if you have a fence and your neighbor has a fence, the area in between can collect debris um, and that can be a, a wildfire risk. So removing that back-to-back -back fencing, um, eliminating combustible siding, replacing it with something non-combustible, enclosing eaves, enclosing under bay windows, upgrading any decking to a wildfire resistant material, and then upgrading windows. Uh, I, I know later tonight you're going to be talking about uh, the California Department of Insurance's Safer from Wildfire framework. And I just want to know, and, and also the proposed regulations that came out about a week after, I just want to note that the mitigation actions identified in wildfire prepared home are very consistent. There's a, a lot of overlap with the Safer from Wildfire framework. Um, we've been working closely with CDI for a while now, and there's been a lot of effort to make sure that as these programs are developed, there's alignment and there's consistency across them. Michael, can you tell everybody what CDI is? Yes, I'm sorry. The California Department of Insurance. Um, and, and, and Commissioner Lara has been a vocal um, advocate for wildfire mitigation, um, and his office a few weeks ago um, helped lead the development of this uh, Safer from Wildfire uh, framework and then put out a set of draft proposed regulations uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so next I wanna talk to you about the designation process. You're probably asking yourselves, oh great, how do I get one of these uh, wildfire prepared home designations? So I just wanna walk you through the process real quick. Um, we are, as we speak, well, most of my colleagues are probably done for the day, but as, as earlier today, um, there were, uh, people were working hard developing kind of the back office operational side of wildfire prepared home. We are building a, uh, a portal, an online portal that you'll be able to visit. The first step on that portal, you'll be able to conduct a free self screen, answering a series of yes, no questions that will give you a sense of whether or not your home as it's currently set up and maintained meets the standard. If you're satisfied that you think you can meet that standard, the next, uh, the next step is to actually submit an application. As part of that application, you'll pay, be asked to pay a fee, probably around $100. Um, that fee will help pay for an inspection. We've contracted with an inspection company called Millennium. They have a statewide reach and they're very experienced in wildfire inspection type things. They've worked with the insurance industry for a long time. They will uh, schedule a visit to your home. It's all gonna be on the exterior of the home and they'll take photographic documentation that your home and property meets all of the requirements of our technical standard. That will then go through a quality assurance process and uh, hopefully assuming that your home meets the standard, IBHS will issue you a designation um, again back through that portal. Unlike, and that designation is good for three years, I should add, but unlike other hazards, wildfire requires continual vigilance and particularly in defensible space, you need to have ongoing maintenance, monthly maintenance. And for that reason, our process, uh, our designation program will have some ongoing processes. Um, in particular, there is an annual landscape review. We're gonna try to make it easy. We're gonna use technology, use cell phones uh, and cameras on cell phones. You should be able to document everything yourself just to make sure that your home and particularly the defensible space component of the standard is still, is still in compliance. You'll be asked to do that annually. Um, and at the end of the three year period, you'll have an opportunity to apply for a redesignation. 
So a little on timing. Wild Power Prepared Home is um, well underway um, in the background and is going to begin this year. We are hoping that as early as this summer, we will be launching the program and issuing our first designations. As California has led the way on so many elements in the fight against wildfire, initially we're gonna make this program available only in California. From there, other states are gonna be able to follow the learnings. And then looking ahead to next year, we're hopeful that we will be able to develop this conceptual framework that will allow us to build out a wildfire prepared community designation as well. So what can you do today? Um, visit our website, please, wildfireprepared.org. You'll find more information uh, on our program. Uh, a lot of the uh, information I provided to you tonight, you'll be able to see right there. And it'll also be an opportunity to keep checking in. As we get closer and closer to launch, there'll be more information on that webpage. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it's really a privilege to be able to speak with you and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the evening. Thanks, Sashi. Thank you so much, Michael. I just, I'm so excited that you that you brought this to us and it was such a visual presentation and, and really kind of showing what, where, how you get your research. Um, I wanted to just uh, note that there was a, a question in the Q&A about um, how, uh, how uh, large developments and, and building codes are, are interacting with, um, you know, with fire risk. And I, I think that um, you know, some, of the, some of the planners and, and folks on this call might be, able to, or might be able to answer a little bit more specifically and we can follow up with you. Uh, but that is, this is a little bit of a, a, um, a struggle within the, the state um, of, the, of, of balancing the interest of, of needing to address the housing issue and needing to make sure that people are safe um, in their safe in their homes from from risks like wildfire, and the wildfire resilience planner that Stephanie mentioned is one of the tools that planners can use to look at the assets at risk and evaluate um, what what they can do to try to make to to try to bring these things into balance and make um, people make sure that life safety and property are being protected. Thanks, Sashi. I, I I didn't mention, but I should add, we've developed this program to be achievable. Um, for both new construction and we'll be working with builders to, to try to help them make new developments that meet wildfire prepared home, but also be achievable via retrofit. Um, you'll notice that uh, some of the actions I identified in wildfire prepared home at that base level, um, some of them just require some sweat equity. Um, wildfire prepared home plus maybe has some more uh, onerous expensive items but we did it in that tiered approach really to make this standard, to make this designation achievable for all homeowners. And uh, we, we, are, we are a little bit, we have a couple more minutes. So I'll just um, get to a couple of things here. Um, they, they asked whether this research was based on Jack Cohen's work. Um, I know that uh, our, our, our Dr. Steve Quarles is also involved in some of the seminal parts of this work. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Quarles is, a former colleague of ours at IBHS, he he uh, worked has worked with us for worked with us for a very long time and continues to work with us. Um, and I saw my colleague Dan uh, nodding vigorously and smiling at the the name of Dr. Jack Cohen. Um, the wild my understanding I am a lawyer, not a wildfire researcher. But my understanding is that the world of wildfire research is relatively small but mighty. And uh, we certainly um, welcome collaborations with the top researchers from around the country and beyond. And, and I see from Dan, Jack Cohen was one of his initial mentors. So there you go. Yes, and, and the, uh, somebody asked about the definition of the zero to five foot ignition zone. So that's just literally the, the zero to five feet perimeter around the structure, is that correct? That's right. We, we call it the home ignition zone. Others call it the ember resistance zone. You'll also hear reference to a zone zero. Um, it goes by many names, but here's the key thing. It is incredibly important for wildfire resilience. Everything we try to do is to prevent embers from igniting. And if they do ignite, to prevent those flames from getting to the home. For that reason, that zero to five foot area around structures, it is just so essential that it be clear of combustible material. And then we'll just do one final uh, question because it's just super relevant is, does the IBHS designation influence the availability of homeowners insurance? Will this depend on fire risk in the homeowner's locality? 
Yeah, um, it's a great question. As uh, Sashi mentioned and I mentioned, our members are the property insurers and reinsurers. Um, I cannot speak uh, for a variety of reasons, including antitrust concerns, as to what individual members, individual insurers will do with wildfire prepared home. What I can tell you is that they understand that there's an issue in California. The regulator, the California Department of Insurance understands there is an issue in California. Everyone wants to find a solution. And our members have been incredibly supportive of us devoting the resources to build out the Wildfire Prepared Home Program. Thank you so much, Michael. So we'll get, if there are any more questions, we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And now we're going to move on to a presentation from, uh, from Cal Fire Division Chief Ben Nichols, who will be giving a presentation on what they're doing on as far as defensible space and compliance with AB 38 and 3074, and that ties very much into what Michael just covered. Chief. Thank you, Sashi, very much. Um, as, as Supervisor Hopkins uh, pointed out when we first started the meeting this evening was that uh, we are coming into yet another fire season with uh, critical conditions uh, as the year develops. Uh, or we're seeing record energy to release components, which is basically how hot the fire will burn and record low fuel moistures for the dead and down across the forest floor uh, here across the coast. So um, we've got a little bit of respite with the rain, the little bit of precipitation we got uh, last week, um, but it's not gonna last. And so as we come into fire season 2022, um, the, the acres count and the fires that are occurring across the entire state, but let alone here in the unit, um, are, are more than we would normally experience this time of the year. So our current conditions are what we would see uh, in an average June, the, the first part of June. So we're, we're well ahead of where we're supposed to be. And so what we can do is, is proactively prepare for those future wildfire events. And so this is where defensible space and home hardening become so critical in your uh, ability to help protect yourself and to help protect the community um, from those future wildfire events. So just gonna go through some quick um, information as far as it relates to the CAL FIRE Defensible Space Program um, and the direction leading into the coming years as a result of the lessons learned from not only our recent fires, but all the great work that the IBHS has done over the years to create that empirical data to be able to really give homeowners the tools and knowledge to better protect their home. So I uh, believe, next slide, please. Um, so CAL FIRE has, has uh, what we call the Public Resources Code 4291, which generated, that drives our defensible space requirements here in the state. And historically, and, and currently to, at this day, um, there are two zones around the house. There's zone one, which is the lean and green zone. And then zone two is the reduced fuel zone. And those are actually required by law around uh, habited structures in the state responsibility area across the state. Um, that requirement goes out to 100 feet from the house or the property line, whichever one comes first. Um, as, as we've seen in the recent fires uh, and the work that the IBHS has done, um, we've, taught, we've realized that embers are a much greater problem than historically thought to be. You know, the, the original defensible space work that was done um, was with the idea that a flaming front or the head of the fire impacted structures as it burned through an area. But we're seeing in these major fire events that the ember cast out in front of the main body of the fire is igniting homes long before the, the actual flaming front of the fire arrives. And, and the zero to five feet distance around that house, be it the, the broom up against the wall, the leaves at the, the bottom of the wall in the corner, like was already discussed, that's what burns down the house long before a, a wall of fire impacts that building. So um, Assembly Bill 3074 um, directed the Board of Forestry um, to work with CAL FIRE to adjust our defensible space requirements. And so coming in 2023 for new construction and 2024 uh, for existing construction, we will be enforcing a, a zero to five feet um, ember reduction zone um, 
as as part of our defensible space program. Um, so as we go through that, we talk about um, the 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 buildup of the surrounding vegetation around the home allows us to create different zones as we're working away from the house due to the direct flame impingement and some of that fire intensity. Um, so in that, that 30 foot zone in zone one, it's the lean and green and we're getting rid of all dead material um, and really creating a, an ignition resistant area. And, and then that one uh, 30 feet to 100 feet out is the reduced fuel zone where we're limiting the fire's ability to rapidly transit from the surrounding wildland into that structure. Um, so as, as we're continuing to develop what zone zero will be required to be under the state standards, um, to the point earlier, we're talking about removing the uh, flammable material within that five feet zone. So the um, use of hardscape, non-combustible material, be it gravel, rocks, pavers, but something that's not going to burn. We want to get rid of all the dead material in there. Historically, um, people have planted, you know, rosemary or junipers in that area because they're they're green and they're easy to maintain. The problem is, is that those plants hide a heavy uh, dead component inside the green outward facing part of the plant and those planted in front of the vents underneath the house or underneath windows in the living room um, create weak points where the fire can actually get into the interior of the house and burn the house down from the inside out. Um, it's obviously critical to keep the branches, all branches, um, 10 feet away from chimneys or stovepipes um, and uh, the combustible materials. So as I mentioned earlier, home hardening and, and defensible space go hand in hand. And so it's not just vegetation that's burning homes down. So it's those combustible items that we have around our house, be it the furniture on the porch, um, the, the little plastic shed alongside the house that, you know, maybe there was a little bit of lumber that didn't get picked up after a project around the house. It's those lightweight combustible things that day to day aren't an issue, but during um, wildfire events, those become a, a real threat to the property. Um, firewood, is, it's the, the ongoing saga of a, of a rural homeowner. During the winter time, you want that, that firewood right next to the house because you don't want to have to go out in the rain to get more wood. But during fire season, it's absolutely critical that that firewood comes off of the house. Um, and I'll put to you that we're in March and we're burning like we would in June. So unfortunately, you know, fire season truly is a year round threat at this point. And so it should be something that you look at long term about uh, long term moving the firewood away from the house and not trying to go back and forth. Um, combustible fencing. Um, the IBH folks put it out there about that, about the fencing in subdivisions. We, we Firefighters have been calling those wicks for the last several years. That is basically a fuse that runs behind all the homes in the subdivision. And to the point that, you know, a subdivision or a community as a whole, it's the weakest link that's the threat to the community, right? Because once the first structure ignites and that fence line ignites, now that fire is transiting down that fence line and it's burning, burning each house as it goes. So it's really critical that if you can, during the home hardening um, uh, efforts for your home is to, to create a non-combustible gate or fence where it attaches to the house so that you break that link in the chain so that the house doesn't um, burn down because of the fence. A garbage and recycling containers were something that obviously were, were front and foremost during the 2017 fires as the Tubbs fire came into Santa Rosa. Um, the material in those cans um, ignited and then um, ultimately damaged and destroyed homes and the surrounding area as well. So getting those cans off of the house. And that's one of those things that I put out there to communities when I'm talking to them about when there's a red flag warning or a wind event that's coming, that's the time to move that, uh, move that non, that combustible material, the garbage cans, the 
the uh, lightweight furniture off the porches, get that away from the house with the idea that your, your house is going to be threatened by that, that fire. And that way that we can have some, some winds out there with non um, ember uh, ready material to catch fire. Next slide, please. So that takes us from the zero to five. So the zero to five is still not here yet for the state standard, uh, but it's coming. But now that can, brings us into the zone one, which is the from the perimeter of the house out to the 30 foot zone. And we're removing all of those dead um, plants, trees, grass, so that we're limiting the ability for the fire to burn into the house. Um, we had a discussion about branches over the roof for Cal Fire and for the state standards currently. Uh, we don't want to see vegetation on the roof. We don't want tree limbs on the roof, but they can be off of the roof with the idea that we're, we're removing the ladder fuels or depriving the fire of its ability to move from the ground into the tops of the trees, which becomes a much more significant fire front as it approaches that house. Um, where we can, we wanna get spacing between the trees so that we can't, the fire can't go from tree to tree into the side of the house. We've already talked about the wood piles. Not only do we want, not want it up against the house, but we don't want it in that 30 foot zone because uh, a cord of wood burning close to the house is gonna, within that 30 foot zone, has a very good chance of direct flame impingement to that house once it's fully going, depending on what the winds are doing. So we want that out of that 30 foot zone. Um, again, we talked about the shrubs in front of the windows. We want those away because that's the, the glass breaks. Um, and then the fire enters the house and, and burns the house down from the inside out. The decks was a, was a big one, especially out in the river area in the West County. We have all that needle cast from the redwoods and, and material that's, that's falling on the house. It gets in between the deck boards and or underneath the deck. And then it's a great uh, catcher's mitt for those embers as that fire is moving into the area. So it's really important to get that vegetation out from underneath the decks and maintain the, the space between your deck boards so that there's not that um, source for embers to, to ignite that house when the fire front's coming. And then again, the name of the game is breaking the continuity from the surrounding vegetation into the house. We're not looking for a clear cut. We're not looking for a moonscape, but what we need is some separation between those plants that you've decided to keep so that, that fire can't rapidly uh, move from plant to plant, bush to bush into your house. Next slide. So it takes us out to zone two, the 30 foot to 100 feet uh, or to the property line. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But now we're into that reduced fuel zone. So um, we're still working on cutting that grass so that that's the light flashy fuel that can bring the fire into the house. Um, we wanna create that separation between the vegetation. We're getting rid of those ladder fuels out there so that the fire stays on the ground as it comes into the house, uh, towards the house, um, those, dead material, the fallen leaves, needles, and all that dead material, we want to try to get that gone as well. And then the wood piles, we want to, to cut down to bare earth around the base of that wood pile. And ultimately, we'd really like to see it covered with a non-combustible tarp so that we don't ignite that burn pile and create more issues for the firefighters trying to defend those structures. And in a perfect world, if you've done everything that you need to do to both have the defensible space and the home hardening, you may not even need a fire engine there to, to protect that home in the first place. And that's where we can work together as a community and as homeowners to make sure that we don't have any more loss than we absolutely have to have. Uh, and then the final deal about zone one and two was the, the uh, propane tanks. We want that bare mineral soil underneath the propane tank, um, the grass mowed around it. A lot of people store things behind it because it's a nice convenient wall, but we don't want any combustible items around that tank because if that tank blevies, it's an explosion because the pressure can't get out of the tank fast enough, that makes a, a mess for everything and, and more than likely um, will damage, damage surrounding uh, structures and or the firefighters that are there defending the home. So just some quick graphics for those folks that aren't familiar with this. I think 
anybody who lives in the West County is already aware of this, but I wanted to share that with you, is that the, the image on the left is that ladder fuel removal. The whole idea is that we're depriving the fire of the ability to move from the ground into the top of the tree, like you see in the middle of the, the picture. Um, and then on the far right side, if you maintain uh, an understory, then that requires you to clear higher up into the tree so that you again have that separation between the lower fuel and the canopy of the tree. Uh, and then to the spacing component, and this is a, a, a subject of, of debate, um, but at the end of the day, it gives you a, a snapshot of, of tools or techniques to be able to create that spacing, because what is the distance? So the, the takeaway for you tonight is that on flat ground, you're looking for basically two times the height of the fuel separation between the, the shrubs you have or the trees. Um, but as the slope increases, you can see in this first slide, um, you're four times the height. And then if you get into the next slide, now you're at six times the, height, the separation. So depending on the slope that you're on is going to dictate what sort of uh, vegetation removal you need to do to in order to make sure that you don't have that flaming front uh, impact the house. Um, and so before we get into AB 38, I just wanted to put it out there to the, to the listeners tonight that there's public resources code 4291 for the state side. But then there's uh, ordinance 13A for the county of Sonoma, and the, the, they're basically um, similar, except for the fact that the public resources code only deals with parcels that have habited structures on them versus 13A, which has unimproved and improved parcels. So the, the takeaway there is that 13A has a little bit more uh, uh, requirements to it in that it wants 10 feet of fuel modification from roadways and on those undeveloped unimproved parcels a 10 foot setback into the property from a, a structure on the adjoining parcel that can't maintain that 100 feet of uh, defensible space. Uh, so that brings me into AB 38. So I, I um, I'm sure it's something that homeowners have dealt with out on the river, and if you haven't yet, you will, um, that when a home is sold in the state of California and state responsibility area or in the very high fire hazard severity zones in the LRA, the local responsibility area, um, some of that is actually in the city of Santa Rosa up on Fountain Grove, um, Assembly Bill 38 requires that a defensible space inspection has been conducted um, prior to the sale, or if it can't be conducted prior to the sale, um, then there has to be an agreement that um, there will be the documentation of the compliance of that inspection within one year of the close of escrow. So the, the idea being is that um, people aren't um, misled onto the, the risk that the house has and um, that it's that's set up for success for those, those new homeowners. Next slide. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. And I, I think that you'll all be kind of seeing a recurring theme here. We've got the, the research from IBHS, and that was also uh, partly what informed the standards that came down um, around the adding of the um, the Ember Resistance Zone, the Zone Zero standards that CAL FIRE um, is promulgating that, it, that uh, Chief Nichols just talked about. And you're gonna be hearing some more about uh, with, uh, in the same theme, from Carolyn Safford, who is uh, from Kermit Sonoma Fire Prevention Division. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows Carolyn very well and has heard a lot of these mess same messages from her. Um, she is uh, someone who li really lives and breathes this stuff and, and knows it so well. So I'm really delighted that she's gonna be here and tell us what's going on from her part of the county, of county government. Carolyn. I'm not hearing you, Carolyn. Can Carolyn, oh, you're on mute, so I can see the the red mic. There you go. Okay, I think now I got all the buttons right. Everything's good. Sounds good. 
All right, thank you everybody very much for including me in this opportunity to highlight Permit Sonoma's Wildfire Risk Reduction Program and very briefly highlight some of the projects that we have in place. Um, to reduce risk in our communities, we basically have two tools. We can work towards making homes and communities more resilient to wildfire ignition through defensible space and especially structure hardening. That's the inside out version. Or we can work towards reducing wildland fuels, thus reducing wildfire intensity and spread into abutting communities. In an ideal world, we're doing both of those congruently at the same time. And this is one of the goals that we've been working towards um, at Permit Sonoma. I'll be briefly, briefly describing some of the grant projects that we have in place and um, describe the pr progression that we're making in this, in this huge uh, battle we're fighting. SoCo Adapts um, is a, one of the first grant programs that we, we wrote right after the 2017 fires. It actually consists of two separate parts and if you can see on the map, I know it's pretty small for you guys, but um, we are starting in part two to address uh, properties in the West County with this program. Um, it addresses 14 uh, at-risk communities across the county. Um, these are phased projects. During phase one, we will be completing approximately almost 7,000 defensible space in assessments, which are based on state and local code. And we're also gonna be offering 1500 structural hardening assessments, which will be starting this summer, um, sometime probably after June. Um, phase one also includes planning, outreach and environmental review on permits Sonoma's side. Um, phase one will end in spring of 2023. When phase one is complete, phase two starts, which is where we have incentive cost share program, wherein we can provide uh, about $3,700 to complete high priority defensible space uh, vegetation management projects and about $7,000 to do structure retrofit. Um, there's a 25% property owner cost and we have incentive funding to address approximately 10% of the parcels that uh, we'll assess. Um, the structure hardening incentives are very largely based on research done by the Insurance Institute. So um, I live and breathe their materials as well. Um, this is an inside out project, right? We are really trying to get after the most important things that keep structures from burning down. On the larger wildland front, we have the Sonoma County Hazardous Fuels Reduction, which is another phased project. That is, um, the goal of that project is to provide forest health and provide to improve forest health and wildfire resilience, protect lives and property by removing hazardous fuels on public and private parcels and road systems in the areas with the red cross hatching on this map. Our selection criteria for these areas included burn history of fires exceeding 5,000 acres, excessive ladder fuels, proximity to high population density and road work capacity limitations. So in these areas, we'll be doing larger scale fuels reduction to reduce either fire damage to ecosystems and really encourage improvement of forest health and habitat. Um, whoops, and this is clearly an outside in um, approach to reducing wildfire risk in our landscapes. Where we're beginning to bring those together is with this, um, the, what is commonly known as the brick grant. Um, let me tell you, it's a unique experience when you hear about a potential grant award from the president himself during a press conference. That announcement took us completely by surprise and created quite a storm of media and community interest. But I have to say that despite the announcement by the president, it is critical to understand that the project is still in FEMA's review process and we have not yet received an official award for this $37 million project. Um, what this project does is it applies strategies that are proven effective against structure ignition, hardening and defensible space, and creates calming zones and buffers near the communities um, that are circled up in the grant. So we can slow fire spread and provide anchor points where forward progress may be stopped or slowed by fire resources. 
Additionally, it provides funding to, bring, funding to bring best available science to apply to the entire county as we move towards the uh, move towards a resilient Sonoma County. The goal is to simultaneously implement mitigation strategies in the built and the natural environments so that wildland fires can occur without becoming human, economic, and environmental disasters. The tools we'll use to do this are um, assessments and incentives and implementation, which looks a lot like how we're doing things for the Welfare Adapted Program, as well as hiring a lot of folks to help us make the best decisions about how we're moving the, the ball down the field for community-wide resistance to wildfire, and creating community fuel breaks, calming zone shaded fuel breaks through a variety of techniques. The uh, project areas were chosen, and they, you can um, apologize for the colors here. I got to change these on this map. They were chosen based on multiple factors, including risk. And we were really looking for highly divergent ecosystems and characteristics of the built environment. Um, within the blue outlined areas, that's where we'll be doing the structure hardening and defensible space assessments. And in the broader yellow outlines, we'll be working with local officials and groups as well as outside experts to determine the best strategy for wildland treatments to reduce risk to lives, property, and enhance environmental values. So that's a big one. Um, we've also recently are in the um, final draft stages of updating the 2016 Sonoma County CWPP, or Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, the requirement for a CWPP was defined in the Healthy Forest Restoration Act in 2003. It just needs to be collaboratively developed, include a risk assessment, address structure hardening. We had 11 meetings virtual across the county to solicit input from residents, and that input was, input, it was put into the plan. Um, the update includes valuable information about wildfire risk reduction strategies and contains a list of projects submitted by groups and agencies across the county. Um, public input for the plan in, um, ended on February 28th. We're now in, incorporating comments and revising the document for final submittal, hopefully by July. Um, on our website, which is what you see over here on the right, there's a ton of information that I really recommend you dive in and take a look at, um, as well as links to updated um, geographic information systems, GIS, wildfire risk data. One of the things that we have done is created a wildfire risk index for the county, which provides a lot of data to really specify the areas at highest risk to wildfire based on how many structures are there, what's the road access, um, and a variety of factors. You can read all about that and the inputs that went into that risk index on the hub site. I'll post those links when I'm uh, through talking. While you're there on the website, don't miss the project mapping and statistical tool, which is a really cool thing. What you see on here now, these are all the projects that were entered um, in the CWPP process. So these are potential projects that people would like to see funded across the county. But you can also in there, draw yourself a polygon for the area that you want. And then you can pull out awesome data about population, risk index, and all kinds of stuff. So definitely go and check that out. Um, this is a map that includes all of our overall, every project that we currently have on the ground. And, you know, we're really proud of the progress that we're making towards making Fire Safe um, Sonoma County a safer community um, at both the community and the wildland scale. And we're really happy to see that so much of our landscape is starting to be covered by the projects that we have rolling forward. Um, here's our basic core team, John Mack, who will be on the call to answer questions later, um, and uh, Steve Matursik, who's the county fire marshal, and myself. I went ahead and put the hub site link in the chat so that people can, uh, can go and see what Carolyn was talking about. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I, I think it's always incredible to see the number of the number of projects that you're that you're carrying for the county and uh, how you can keep them all straight is really uh, is really impressive as always. Thank you so much, Leo. Can you bring up the bring up the presentation? And I'm going to try to get through this last bit really quickly so that we can get to further Q and A. Um, so again, reinforcing the same kind of messages that we've been talking about here. 
um, the California in, uh, Insurance Commissioner in partnership with uh, the Department of Insurance, the Office of Emergency Services, the Office of Planning and Research and CAL FIRE and the Public Utilities Commission created the Safer from Wildfires Insurance Framework. Next slide. And this is, these are the, these are the three components of the, of the framework um, uh, that uh, Insurance Commissioner Lara has put forward, um, protecting the structure, protecting the immediate surroundings and working together as a community. And this is all again, based on IBHS research um, as a big part of this. Next slide. One of the exciting parts of this is that they have put together a list of insurers that are currently offering discounts. And uh, we're gonna be sending out that link to all of you. Um, there are a number of um, residential insurance companies that have decided to work with the insurance commissioner and specifically offer discounts to people who are, um, uh, who are, are, are working on maintaining their defensible space. You know, one of the e easy ways for you to, 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 to think about doing that is using the IBHS uh, certification, uh, wildfire prepared home certification process. Um, but as you can see from all the people who presented today, there are a number of different tools and, and, and um, ways that you can figure out what it is you need to do for your specific home. And there were a couple of questions that came up about, um, you know, well, what about this about, you know, I have a, a, a wooden home where I have stairs or what about succulents in, in, in the first five feet? If, if you can get a defensible uh, space inspection from your, from whether it's Cal Fire or whatever your fire district is, they can really give you a more specific picture of what your specific conditions require. Um, different homes, you know, uh, oriented differently, um, and you know, depending on the you know the the, the slope, the aspect, the weather, um, all these different things, different things, different recommendations could really fit for different sets of conditions. Next slide, and then I just wanted to give you kind of a um, a, a preview that um, of some of the research that we're doing. We're doing a little um, uh, analysis of the insurance trends. So the the Department of Insurance put out some data on non-renewals and fair plan applications and some of the new rate filings. And we're in the process of doing a little uh, a little analysis of that. And we're going to put together a little brief paper on that so that people can kind of see where things are going. Um, there uh, um, are overall more new rate filings. Um, and I think the, the trend towards non-renewals is um, you know, potentially shifting direction here. Um, once we finish the analysis, we will let you know a little bit more about that. But then let's move on to questions. I think we've been basically keeping up with the questions, um, but if you've got questions, okay, let me see, let me pull up the Q and A, we've got some more here. Um, and it's been really great to have this whole county team here be able, able to answer questions. So please feel free to, to ask, all, answer all, ask all your questions. Okay, um, it looks like John is answering this one about permits and over projects being done to bring them to scale. Um, I don't know if John, you wanted to answer live. I'm almost done typing. If that's okay, well, I don't, feel, I'll, I'll, don't, you know, don't have to, won't make you multitask. Um, then there's a question here. Is anyone doing fire progression mapping to show the before and after impacts on actual fire behavior? What about wildlife and water assessments to see the impacts of vegetation management on water quality and wildlife? Okay, I think actually a number of people here could answer that question. Um, the uh, Actually, uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to um, uh, talk about um, impacts on fire behavior. Uh, I, I would or, actually, or maybe Dan. <laughs> yeah, I would defer to Dan for a technical question like that. Yeah, sure. And I, I guess I would say I, I think the Jenny, your question is well uh, said. Um, you know, there's this kind of cross-functional impact or how fire impacts other things. Um, it's things that I'm aware of. I, I know that there are individuals and groups and and, and pushing toward better understanding that. Um, I would say from IVHS's perspective, we look to others that are doing that and incorporating those considerations into programs like Wildfire Prepared Home and Wildfire Prepared Community. Uh, Chief Nichols, do you want to say anything about the impacts before and after on um, actual fire behavior? Sure. So um, CAL FIRE, especially during major fires, when the, the incident management team comes in, one of their responsibilities is to, to have a progression map on how that fire spread. And, and that helps us post-incident um, when the um, Watershed Emergency Response Task Force comes in and analyzes the impact to the soil and the surrounding areas 
um, as to the, the threat for post-fire debris flows and, and damage to the landscape. So, uh, and then also, you know, the progression map based on what the fuels were before and after uh, helps firefighters um, put together, you know, at that point in time in the fire, with the conditions that were there, that was that's what's driving that. I mean, it, it's it's a tough one because the wall bridge is a great example where you had a, a fire that that was was laying down it was a ground fire overnight and in the early morning. Uh, but as it came down Mill Creek and Wallace Creek um, in the afternoon, when there was an alignment with the wind, the topography, and the surrounding fuels, it created much more severe burning conditions. So the, those progression maps help tell that story post-fire. And what Chief Nichols alluded to there too is the fire behavior triangle, which I think many of you probably have heard of, which is uh, fire behavior is a, is a function of the, the weather, the topography, and the fuel. Um, so the uh, after, after, after a fire, there's going to be a different set in a, a different um, behavior than it would be before. And I know um, Carolyn has done a lot of, of work on um, trying to get some help to the parts of the county that have um, post-fire um, uh, conditions. Uh, Carolyn, I don't know if you want to mention anything about, I think the brick rant, I think you, you, there was a lot of focus on um, parts of the county that had been impacted by fire already. The uh, couple of the project areas, there's one that's sort of in the Rio Nito Guerneville area that um, was somewhat impacted um, by the wall bridge, obviously, and um, the Mark West wiki up project area very, very heavily impacted by the tubs in 17. And so that was um, some of the idea of that is uh, there is a lot of uh, dev material that are left out there and figuring out exactly what is the best management practice for how much do we move, how much do you leave, do you, um, is part of the goal of the BRIC and the Hazardous Fuels Grant. John, do you wanna ping in on that? Um, no, but there was a long multi-part question we could go to, Sasha. Yep, I can see that one there. Um, I'll just uh, um, uh, quickly answer the other half of that question about uh, wildlife and water uh, water assessments, uh, the impact of vegetation management on water quality and wildlife. Um, that's one of the things that the Wildfire Resilience Planner is intended to do is to help um, to help you prioritize um, projects and also considering the impact on wildlife and water quality um, as well. One and, thing uh, I, yeah, I, can ahead, add to that, I can add to that is after all, all the fires, we had a we formed a watershed task force with the county, the state and federal agencies, uh, lots of players on the ground. And there was quite a bit of monitoring, especially after the Tubbs fire, but even after the other ones. And fortunately, the, there wasn't any significant impacts that were measured. You know, so it seemed like the the impact on the quality on water quality was seemed low or modest at best or at worst, um, so. Thank you so much. I think um, the, uh, the, the, the multi-part question um, that John alluded to is uh, talking about a number of different strategies um, to enhance wildfire resilience, um, many of which are being implemented by those people who are, who are here on this call. Um, Carolyn Safford's um, Wildfire Adapted Program um, is, looking at defensible, defensible space and home hardening inspections. Um, I know CAL FIRE is working on training programs on, um, uh, on defensible space inspections. Um, uh, Dave Winokur, I know, is working on that one. Um, and uh, establishing wildfire buffers and, and protective corridors, um, the Wildfire Resilience Planner, which we're developing in uh, partnership with Sonoma Water, is very much focused on um, figuring out how you, we can encourage collaboration and create wildfire buffer zones um, to make communities safer. Um, and uh, since we have, since we have Kim Batchelder here from um, Ag and Open Space, Kim, I don't know if there's anything you wanna, um, on, wanna highlight um, that, uh, that your uh, vegetation management grant program is, is um, doing in the county. I know you've got one project in the county um, and a bunch of other projects that you're working on with the new set of grants. Yeah, right. So uh, we have been able to fund 19 projects as of uh, 2021 and are taking, and that was to the tune of about $3.6 million to help support communities that had a plan, had a, a vegetation area that they really wanted to treat. Uh, and so we've been working with CAL FIRE and uh, Permit Sonoma 
to really identify the best priorities for those types of treatments and working with communities have an interest in treating those vegetation uh, uh, areas. So one of the things that we are doing, we just did a, a round of grants in uh, December and uh, we're finalizing our recommendations to the Board of Supervisors uh, for uh, hopefully 17 projects that will be funded this year. So uh, we're looking forward to getting those rolling out. Thank you so much, Kim. And I think you can see we really have such a great team here at the county, you know, everybody really working on different areas, um, but all pulling together to really be supportive of the community. Um, uh, Chief Nichols, there was a question about um, being able to get uh, an assessment on a one acre, one acre property. Um, oh, it looks like you may have, oh, somebody else answered that. Uh, Chief Nichols, um, how can somebody schedule um, an assessment? So it depends on what the assessment is. If it's just a defensible space inspection, then they're more than welcome to uh, contact uh, our headquarters at 967-1400. Uh, to ask for that in, uh, an inspection of their property. Um, but if it's a CFIP, a forest improvement program, uh, that may not be something that we can do just because of the size of the project. So it would, it would be dependent on what, what the assessment was looking to accomplish. But we're, we're happy to, to come out and work with landowners to prepare their home uh, and provide advice to them on what they can do. Thank you, Chief Nichols. Um, there was some question about how fire behavior is impacted by vegetation removal. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the welfare risk index that's used by the CWPP also incorporates that and the uh, North Coast Resource Partnership, which covers all of the North Coast, Coast counties, recently put together a funding package to do another run of LIDAR to map um, the fuels now that we've had and you know had had a, a bunch of changes in the last so it last since the last round of lidar um, and then that will be able to be put in through um, uh, into the models and we'll be able to kind of see what the what the level of risk is now with the new um, with the new lidar so that's yet another resource that's working for you um, do you support map your neighborhood you know that one's a new one on me does anyone here have um, know any, uh, anything about map your neighborhood no, not seeing that one. Um, we'll look into that one for you. Um, I actually can jump in on that one. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, you know, a couple, yeah, a couple of our local Rotary clubs were actually supporting Map Your Neighborhood, and um, you know there are a number of essentially disaster preparedness programs, including Map Your Neighborhood, Cope, and Cert, of varying levels of, um, I guess I would say self empowerment. You know, from one that really goes into triage and, and kind of more formal training to something like Map Your Neighborhood, which is really about honestly identifying which neighbors need help which neighbors have potential assets like a truck or a generator um, or other, other things like that. And so, you know, anything that connects you to your neighbors is really a good thing. And that's actually what we've seen even unfortunately in communities that were impacted by wildfire was the communities that really had those close connections help folks through the rebuild. And I think it also goes to the same end when it comes to fire preparedness, which is know what your neighbors, what neighbors need help, right? come together for block parties to help clear, you know, vegetation, maybe on some of your neighbors who might not be as physically capable as other ones. So, um, you know, I really do think that any of those programs that bring you together and more focus on educating you and bring your community um, into a preparedness state is absolutely a good thing. I also wanted to just sort of briefly follow up on Tom Conlon's really detailed question. I know we touched on it briefly, but I would say, Tom, after reading through that, I could say that seven out of the eight are being actively pursued either by the county or one of our partner agencies. Um, and, you know, the one that I would say isn't being as much actively pursued, but I've had multiple conversations about it really is the TDR land buyouts. Again, it's been in a conversation state, but not sort of an active policy pursuit state, but I would be happy to follow up with you, um, Tom, to kind of explain that. It just, I think we could spend half an hour on that one question. It's a great question. Thank you, Supervisor Hopkins. And I think that you're really, um, bringing up an important um, way of thinking about this, which is this is a shared responsibility that all of our uh, community, this is all of our community. And there are the things that are being done at the jurisdictional level, at the county, um, at the CAL FIRE level, all of these different groups that are here um, doing work to protect the community and give the community information. And then there's what you can do as part of your neighborhood and um, as part of your community. You, take care of your, you know, your family and your home, you take care of your neighborhood and anything that you can do as Supervisor Hopkins said, to connect with your neighbors, a connected neighborhood is a resilient neighborhood. And all of these things that we're bringing forward here are tools to help you do that. And um, 
there, there, there are definitely things that um, your county government is going to be doing to help as far as um, you know ev evacuation routes and inspections. Um, but then all of that is just in support of what you're doing for your neighborhood and your community. Um, uh, Mr. Conlon yeah, ahead, had Kim. another question. Uh, Mr. Conlon had a really good question about what percentage is being spent on the inside out versus outside in. And there's it's it's a blurry line because we're really, I think uh, Ag and Open Space and the Vegetation Management Grant Program really is trying to look at that outside in and trying to find those uh, critical rich lines that we can try to create some type of defensibles or a shade of fuel breaks and such. Um, but then that uh, that uh, that uh, inside out perspective is really, I think, Permit Sonoma and Carleon, they're doing great work on being able to fund and assess those types of projects and how to best get that done on the ground. So I don't think we can come up with exact figures, um, but we can certainly I, work on it. I could say in the BRIC grant, the budget is two thirds to the inside out and one third to the outside in. And I could add too that that um, encouraging that um, near home fuels reduction and especially structure hardening is um, really much more difficult to get people to understand and move forward on. Um, people tend to look out at those wildland areas and that's what they see as the risk and convincing them that really if what you wanna do is not have your house burned down it's kind of up to what you do within your bubble and to the home itself. And it's a, it's a much more difficult concept for folks to understand. And it's expensive and it's hard. And so it's a, it's a harder ball to push up the slope. But we're doing it and um, people now know what structure hardening is. There's been tremendous uh, increase in understanding of that concept since 2017. So I think that we're, we're moving forward, but it is not an easy task. Thank you. So there's a question here. What about densely built up small lot villages like Jenner? How do we develop defensible perimeters when we do not have 30 feet, 10 meters from dwellings to property lines? Um, maybe Daniel or Michael can talk about the research and then we can maybe have Chief Nichols talk about what he thinks. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question and it's a big challenge. Um, you know, we know when it comes to structural separation, the research is literally underway. Dan and, and other colleagues of ours at IBHS um, are spending big chunks of the year studying that very question, right? We know that if two homes are 100 feet away from each other, that's probably far enough. If they're five feet away from each other, that's probably too close. What is that kind of sweet spot and what can we do? What can you do in your development when your neighbor is... 10, 15 feet away from your living room? Um, the answer I think is for now, you do what you can based on the circumstances in which you live. Um, so we understand that um, part of our guidance is, you know, if you have an outbuilding, you wanna move it 30 feet away, but maybe 30 feet away is your neighbor's kitchen. Um, but again, you do the best you can with the circumstances where you are. If you take the actions that you can based on those circumstances, you can at least reduce your risk. And that's all any of us can do. Chief Nichols, anything to add about Jenner particularly? Jenner is a great example because you have a defensible line around you with the, the grass and the grazing around Jenner proper you have a built-in uh, defense line around your community. And, and to the conversations earlier, your, your community is, is especially with a, a dense community, is, is, is only as strong as your weakest link. And so if it's a landowner that, that has a hard time um, with resources and or the ability to, to help um, prepare their yard, then working together, you know, there's been some great work north of Jenner uh, up in the coastal ridges where, where neighbors are helping neighbors to, to take care of each other. And so that's, um, you know, that grassroots effort to, to take care of one another um, without looking for a, a huge lift from somewhere else. In, in communities like that, I would add that this is where you really have to have a community-wide focus. So developing a fire safe council for Jenner so that 
there is a group who is internally pushing out this information to the entire community so that you get community-wide acceptance of these principles and ideas is absolutely critical because one house is with defensible space is great. 10 houses with defensible space is way that more than 10 times more effective. Um, so we really have to take this community-wide approach, which is why the BRIC and the Wildfire Adapted, we're doing those community inspections of all of the parcels in those areas, get that defensible space inspection, because that's the idea. We're looking for that community-wide compliance. Stephanie, do you want to uh, talk about the, the board? The board has funded some tools that you just mentioned that um, are helping, helping a bit with that. Stephanie? Oh, me. There you Absolutely are. no, no. The board has been very uh, um, supportive of efforts, and they have funded tools like the Wildfire Fuel Mapper and the Decision Support or the uh, Wildfire Resiliency Mapping Tool. And so, what the board is um, providing is funding to it. We could help landowners address from a private landowner perspective, so that they could look at what's important for them to have and their own individual uh, properties. And then the larger landscape with the resiliency for, um, wildfire mapping tool. And so we can look at larger areas. And so that combined with the funding that Kim is managing through Ag and Open Space, it's, it allows landowners to look at their properties, decide what their goals are, and then to select the tools to achieve those goals, and then to work collectively through the CWPP or their other processes to then seek out grants, either through Ag and Open Space or other state or, or federal funding. And so it's been a really nice collaboration from the County of Sonoma, the Board of Supervisors, and the departments of Sonoma County and the private and public landowners. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, maybe Chief Nichols, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you'd be the one to answer. Is there anything that can be done to report homes that appear vacant or abandoned in neighborhoods which have obvious risks for fire or to, to educate the owners about their responsibility? Um, we, the, so the county of Sonoma, probably Carol owns a better person to, to answer that question. Uh, we, we don't uh, abate homes, so I'll turn that over to the county. Um, the only way to do that is to um, launch a complaint with your local fire district first. Um, and if that mm, property is found to be out of compliance with the applicable code, which will be either um, state responsibility area, 4291 standards, or um, Sonoma County Code Chapter 13A standards. If, there, if it's found to be out of compliance with those codes or a significant safety issue, um, abatement is, is possible. But um, you need to um, send a complaint to, you can send it to Permit Sonoma, and we can, um, pass it on to the most appropriate agency. We have a uh, enter a complaint site on the permits and number website. So you can actually put in a complaint and if it goes to a district, we'll forward it to the district, but um, it is possible. For more general zoning code violations, as far as house houses and things like that, that you can use that complaint point that Carly, I mentioned or refer, you know, call, refer things to our code enforcement department. They're the ones that handle like that. Yeah, and my, my staff might kill me for this, but you can always email us if it's in West County. We actually handle a lot of this in terms of referring it to the appropriate um, department or agency. So it's district five, the number five at sonoma-county.org, and we will do whatever we can. I also would encourage just knocking on the door and, you know, if it is actually a neighbor, right, try the, the sort of soft approach first. If it's an absentee neighbor and you're not getting anywhere, then absolutely we can assist in escalation. I think we're, we're, we're right at the end of the time, but I, I know that um, Leo had some questions from Facebook. Um, if we want to try to do a couple of quick ones and then we'll, 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 we'll get all the ones that we didn't, didn't get to, we'll definitely send out a follow-up email with some, with some uh, answers to that. Sure. I mean, it seems like on Facebook, both um, during, there was a question about um, Jessica Jarvis actually raised that fire insurance for home and property are so hard to find that they are calling it by other names in the policy and to be aware. And then other um, people in advance, Carl Wall sort of was asking about some of the work that Michael Newman was talking about in terms of whether the insurance industry could incentivize um, home hardening and give discounts, which uh, it's clear that that's something that's being looked at. But um, I guess I'm wondering if 
that's something that can also be done to sort of address people who are facing cancellation of policies. Um, one of the Facebook comments in advance was someone who had to reach out to more than 16 insurance companies in order to get insurance and her rate went from 6,000 to 12,000 a year. So there's a certain amount of despair around that. And Sashi, I know you talked about how um, you're seeing trends that, that might be turning around, but if any of you have guidance for people who are struggling with insurance on, on what they should do if they're having trouble getting insurance, and I guess if there are any sort of tricks or traps that people should avoid. Well, I think that there, there's, there, um, you're, you're bringing up an important issue in that um, there, there are two things people are worried about. One is that their insurance is going to be canceled, and two is that their insurance is going to be very expensive. Um, so I think that um, uh, all the things that we talked about tonight are things that you can do to make your home safer, which is good for you, and also is good for the insurers. Um, and uh, it, uh, Michael and Daniel, you know, kind of jump in on 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 this if there's more that you want to add. Um, and I know that um, uh, fire districts and Cal Fire have also had good luck in uh, when they when they come out and do an inspection and people do some remediation, helping to give some documentation to the homeowner that they can pass back to their insurance company um, and show, look, we've actually, you know, we, we've, we've made the home a lot less risky. And uh, so now you should reconsider us in a different light. Um, you know, Michael and Daniel, I don't know if you have anything to add or, or Chief Nichols. I would, I would just uh, point to a statement that uh, Commissioner Lara has made recently that uh, 17 insurers representing 40% of the marketplace in California already do offer some type of mitigation discount um, for homeowners that take undertake uh, different types of wildfire mitigation. Um, we understand it's a challenge. As I said in my remarks, one of the reasons that we created Wildfire Prepared Home was to respond to this need in California um, from the insurance side as well as from the resilience side. So we're gonna push forward, we're gonna get this tool into your hands and hopefully it will uh, alleviate uh, some of those pressures. Thank you. Chief Nichols. Chief Nichols, do you have anything else? No. Okay. Well, it, it looks like we're we're at time, and I know that we have a few few more um, dangling questions, and we had some some questions that were emailed. If you if you do want um, us to follow up with you, um, reach out to District Five or reach out to us here at UC Cooperative Extension. Um, I think I sent put out my email in the um, in the chat at some point. Um, and we can, are definitely happy to follow up with you personally. And we, this team is here for you. We have, we have Permit Sonoma, we have um, the Board of Supervisors with, with um, Supervisor Hopkins here. Um, we have UC Cooperative Extension, um, we have Ag and Open Space, and some of the other departments that um, are also kind of working behind the scenes, Regional Parks, Emergency Management, um, Sonoma Water, uh, TPW, all of the departments of the County of Sonoma are here to help you and assist you in making your home safer. And I just wanna really thank everybody and this, this great team that we had here on this, on this Zoom. I'm just really excited to have all you guys work, uh, working together. Um, and definitely th big thank you to uh, Supervisor Hopkins and, uh, and to Leo and your staff. And it's just been a pleasure working with you and seeing how really tuned in you are to the community. And uh, I really wanna thank you for that. We'll right back at you. And I just want to echo the thanks for all of our agency partners. I mean, for those of us you who are listening, government typically operates in its own little silos. And, you know, if you had talked to us January 1st, 2017, we wouldn't all be friends. But everyone that you see on the screen here, we are all friends. We are all laser focused on trying to keep our community safer and make it safer each and every year. And so please reach out if you have questions that weren't answered. Please reach out if you have ideas of things that we aren't yet looking at that we could explore. We're also always open to new information because our goal is every year for our county to become more safe, more resilient, um, and more adapted to our wildfire climate. Um, last little plug, I know that Stephanie mentioned it, um, but I highly recommend there are some really um, great workers that you can hire who will actually give you a benefit back. Chickens are very great at um, getting your soil down to bare mineral soil in that sort of area right around your home. Ducks make great mowers. And if you've got some goats, you've got, you know, a little bit more space. They're really great at taking out um, wild blackberry, little sort of willow shoots, the kinds of things that can really uh, provide ladder fuel. So don't forget farmers or becoming your own homestead, because that's also another way of tackling vegetation management on your property. Um, and you get the benefit of eggs and milk back. So who can ask for more? Thank you all so much um, this evening for joining us. And thank you, Sashi. You're an amazing, amazing MC and just really, really grateful for all of the work. 
um, that you and, and Leo also put into getting this all set up tonight. Thank you, everybody. Great job, Sashi. All right.